Uh, hi, my name is Phil Kirshner. I'm a senior expert at McKinsey & Company. I sit in the intersection of our real estate and people practices and lead most of the firm's thinking around the future of the physical workplace and associated employee experience. Uh, today we're here to talk about you know, building you know, and maintaining productive and engaged and connected teams in a digital environment because the pandemic has caused a truly tectonic change in how we do our work. And despite all the best efforts between most companies, at least being together some of the time, uh, we will not all be together all of the time in all the configurations that we might uh, desire or predict. So it's really important to think about what we can do to glue our organizations together uh, you know, around productivity and experience in a digital context. And I'm really excited to moderate a quick conversation between two absolute experts in the field. And I'll have you both uh, just introduce yourselves and set a little bit of the context for why you're here. Cool, thanks. Uh, I'm Darren Murph, uh, currently at Ford, spent four years at GitLab, the world's first fully remote company to IPO, uh, where we built workplace operations to sustain that. So excited to be here today. Awesome. Hi, I'm Molly Sands, and I lead the Team Anywhere Lab at Atlassian. At Atlassian, we have a fully distributed global organization where everyone can work where they want each and every day. And my team focuses on developing evidence-based practices that help distributed teams be really successful. Yeah, and I think your two model are just excellent pair of examples for everybody listening because most companies are either dominantly back in an office or exploring hybrid in some way with a strongly suggested minimum amount of time that somebody be there. And GitLab, Darren, where you're coming from, fully remote, never had an office. At Lassie and Molly, where you are, continue to have offices built for very particular purposes, but give employees full autonomy about when to be there. So uh, glad to hear you pair it off of each other. Uh, so really just to set the stage, the great debate of our time now is probably that work used to be thought of as a place, somewhere we go, but now we, have a much greater appreciation for it being something that we do, a verb. Uh, and maybe you get started with Darren if you want to offer sort of your perspective of how we think about that as a framing for leaders uh, in this new world of work. Yeah, it's, it, for me it starts with uh, meeting leaders where they are. And uh, when I advise from Series A startups all the way to enterprises, I try to start the framework around work being a product, specifically distributed work being a product, not a policy that you set. And what I've seen through the pandemic is a lot of organizations attack this from the policy lens. And so they went to their HR team and they said, hey, draft a policy on the legalities of where people can work. Here's a one pager, and wash their hands of it. And then they expected it to work really well. And now they're wondering, well, why are we having connection issues or culture issues or collaboration issue issues? And the truth is a policy is not broad enough in scope to appropriately do what you need to do for all of those things to be high functioning. So what does it mean to be a product? If you were taking a product to market, you would go forward with a hypothesis. You would see what the market tells you. You would take that input, have retrospectives. You would tweak the product. You would do an alignment on how to find product market fit. So in this example, remote work or distributed work would be the product. Your team members are the customers. And organizations can learn a lot by asking, what do you need? What tools are missing now that you're in a distributed space? What upskilling is missing now that you're in a distributed space? And it's important to approach this uh, through a series of steps, iterations. For most companies, this is a multi-year journey. There's no silver bullet. And for uh, organizations to do this well, it really starts with putting someone in charge, just like you would on a product team, a product leader, and then making small but explicit steps on changing the how around work. Mm. Well, you at Atlassian have a branded product of sorts for your workplace experience in Team Anywhere. You mind sharing a little bit about that as a framework? Yeah, absolutely. So we've really used this change in where we work to think about how we work really differently. And we make digital collaboration tools, so of course we're in a position where we are thinking a lot about how can teams be connected across the world, align on their goals, and design and deliver really amazing ideas together in ways that are not dependent on them being in the same physical location. And so we've both taken a lens in terms of how do we come together and what does that look like for us when we are having these in-person moments. Um, but we also think a lot about what are the ways that we can help everyone get focused on the work that matters most and have the right systems in place so they can coordinate and collaborate and really build 
meaningful solutions together. That's great. Uh, you both kind of hinted at one of the purest maybe or most common units of measure now we think about work, which is meetings. And that is something that has probably been most disrupted by COVID and why a lot of leaders are saying we need to come back for ideation, for innovation, to make decisions like we used to. Uh, can you comment, you know, maybe starting with Darren, how you think about meetings as like the atomic unit of work and how that has to change in this world? Well, I think meetings is a good place to start because no matter what your organization's size or industry, you probably have meetings or you've at least heard of them. So it's a common thing that we can uh, rally around. I think the, where this starts is, can you codify what your meeting hygiene is? So let's just start there is are meetings a free-for-all or do we have some guardrails around meetings? Are meetings recorded? Is there an AI note taker that will generate notes and action items out of these meetings? Uh, do we start meetings at five after the hour? Do we end them five minutes before to give people some time to be humans between meetings? Do we have do uh, documentarians or note takers during meetings? Do we have shared agenda documents attached to the actual calendar invite so that as soon as you are invited, you can have context on what will be discussed? Nothing here is rocket science necessarily, but they're, they're a series of very intentional steps that begin to frame up what is our position on meetings? What is our system around meetings? What is our cultural code around meetings? And you can take this small example and start to put some of these in practice, and you'll see that this can be scaled to every layer of collaboration, from meetings to workflows to brainstorms. The more structure that you put in place to a point will be helpful if you're grappling with, we used to use the office to wrangle these guidelines, now we don't have it. So in a, in a distributed space, that structure and clarity really helps bring teams together. Yeah. Molly? Yeah, meetings are really the most overused tool in modern work. And we see that when we survey organizations about what the greatest challenges they face. People are just trying to use meetings for almost everything, but they're most often not effective for those purposes. One of the most remarkable things we've seen in our data across over 5,000 knowledge workers is that people feel are three times as likely to feel connected to their colleagues when they spend time with them solving a hard problem versus when they spend a lot of time with them in meetings. And it really seems true that across use cases, whether you're trying to connect, collaborate, communicate progress or status of work, make decisions, meetings are not consistently the right way to do that. And I think this really speaks to your point about being intentional about how we use meetings and being really clear about when we're just sharing information or we want something to actually extend beyond the four walls of a meeting or the four virtual walls mm -hmm. of a meeting. Yeah. When is that the case? Totally. And you know, I think you agree, or we all agree, that, like meetings made us feel busy, made us feel productive. We were all there together. Uh, but now to sustain a hybrid or fully distributed environment, we really have to promote a culture of trust and transparency, kind of a culture of writing things down, as you uh, alluded to. Um, can you both comment a little bit on what you would recommend uh, for companies struggling with this for really measuring productivity, maybe not with that severe word, but how do you know that someone is doing something or some process is going the way you think it's going if you were you know, blindfolded in your house for a week and couldn't talk to your team, couldn't meet with them uh, to create that culture of transparency? You want to start with that one, Molly? Yeah, to me, this really starts with getting very clear about what success looks like and what we're trying to accomplish together. If we have a shared understanding of what our goals are, it makes it much easier for people to make progress that is meaningful and can help get them out of that super reactive mode of the way I can show that I'm high impact is responding to messages, responding to, to emails, just being there. What we really want to do is free people up from that so that they can design and deliver really creative work. And the first way to do that is to make sure that those expectations are clear and that we all understand what we're doing and why. Mm. Can you give maybe an example? I know from uh, the live version of this conversation, yeah. people jump immediately to teams that deal with calls or tickets or action, something that's really explicit, maybe in your own work, uh, how, you, how you measure progress and know as a manager what's going on? Yeah, absolutely. So within my team, I have a lot of researchers. They're using data. They're designing learning interventions. It's not a traditional ticket kind of system. Um, but we do document all of our goals really clearly in a system called Atlas. 
Um, it's an Atlassian tool that we use to share transparently across the organization. Any team in the whole company can follow my team and see what we're working on. And each week, we share updates about each of the projects that are driving our accomplishments against those goals. And so we'll have just a short update. Uh, 180 characters or less that's saying, here's how it's going, here's key risks, here's a success or a win. And that makes it really easy for anyone, including myself, to review and see what has happened across the team. Where are there places that we really want to celebrate and acknowledge accomplishments? And where are there places where there's risks or other needs and we want to step in and pr solve problems together? Great. Darren, you want to comment for maybe a little bit back to your old life of how GitLab sustained this and maybe the processes that applied to you know, your team, right, you not being in the core software development engine, like how you use the same transparency, and then to a degree how you're learning to apply those principles in now a 200,000 person company that uh, moves physical goods around the world in a way that GitLab doesn't? I'll start by saying high trust in people begins with high trust in tools. It's much easier to trust the people in your organization and the teams that you work with if you can trust the tools that you're sharing information through. And in a distributed setting, you have fewer opportunities to transmit information one-on-one -on -one or verbally. More often than not, you are tapping into a system of information and extracting or retrieving information. And so it really is, it behooves leaders to take a hard look at what are the systems that we're using to collaborate. Most engineering or IT teams have this figured out. You get a support ticket, for example, there's probably a ticketing system where you can follow the saga of that piece of information. You have to extend and apply that to any project that gets started. Atlas is a great example. There are lots of other project management tools. And a lot of companies probably already have licenses to these. They just need to use them more broadly. So I always split it into two camps. One is the culture around tooling, what are the tools that we're gonna use? And then the second part is honoring and respecting guidelines about work happens in these tools in this way. Codifying that is step one. And Molly didn't explicitly mention this, but having a person or a team responsible for owning this, it is they are accountable for operating and operationalizing this is really critical. This is something that is really big and to some degree, it's everyone's job to participate, but it can't be everyone's job to lead. And a lot of organizations are trying to make this a line item mm -hmm. for the chief people officer or chief operating officer. It truly deserves its own person, if not team, depending on the size and scale of your org. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. Any company that is leading now with head of remote, head of virtual work, head of employee experience, there's often for the successful ones kind of a full stack uh, if not like engineering team, but data and change management and strategy and architecture all doing nothing but that all the time in order to, to cross this kind of Herculean task. Um, so with many managers saying like, I want you to come back to the office to get the work done. Right? Like, I don't know what you're doing. We have to get back to having meetings. The other side of the coin is, I think we've lost something. Uh, our culture, our connection, our mentoring, our apprenticeship, the like, people glue of the organization. We shift gears maybe briefly and uh, start maybe with you, Molly, how you think about that problem and go about like measuring, uh, are things working? Are we really losing culture? And then the practical advice for how to sustain it, how to like strengthen those bonds even when you're not together most of the time, if ever. Yeah, it's definitely one of the common objections I hear the most when we talk about our distributed model is, oh, but what about culture? Do you have a culture? And it's so interesting to me because being at Atlassian and having worked in other companies that were remote that had extremely strong cultures, this is a question that just doesn't quite compute to me. Um, really, the culture is a lot about how you work. Right? So if I'm respectful of people's time, if I communicate clearly, if we have an agreement that we're going to share this information in this way and I follow that consistently, if I'm helping you solve problems, those are the things that really do create a, a very important fabric of the culture and lead to that trust that we've been talking about so much. But we also think a lot about how do we have fun at work, right? There are things that, in offices that can be fun. Yeah. There are also lots of ways that we can have fun when we're apart. Um, and so 
With our teams at Atlassian, we have a few things we do. One, we do believe in-person time matters. So we have an intentional togetherness gathering program where we bring teams together on site in our office locations so that they can do collaborative work. And we insist that they have fun during that time. They go out to dinner, they do activities, they do volunteer work and give back to those local communities. They do all these things when they're in person together, which strengthens the bonds for the team. And we actually see that those teams work together more efficiently for several months following just a few days gathering together and also feel more connected for up to four to five months. It's amazing. And I know from experience with your colleague, Kim, who is here, uh, even in the built environment where you have different groups coming in for different reasons, that workplace experience team, again, someone thinking about it all the time, is there to offer the option for teams that don't know each other to get to know each other through a, like, largely a fun event or some kind of mixer internally. Uh, to fill the batteries a little bit on, on trust and connection. Darren, your thoughts on like creating, creating the glue? I'll give you one tactical example. Yes. A lot of organizations came to me early in the pandemic and said, uh, help us solve Zoom happy hours. They worked for the first Friday and now no one comes anymore. <laughs> and so my solve, if you're listening to this, is something that I termed community impact outing. It's the same hour spent you just deploy people to spend an hour in their local community, wherever they happen to be in the world. It can be any hour during their week. And the only instruction is to do something life-giving to them that is personally meaningful, uniquely meaningful to them. And take a selfie while you're doing it. Then the organization creates a mode for them to share that back, whether that's a team Slack channel, whether that's 15 minutes in the next all hands, some sort of medium to share that information and those photos back and then let people see what's happening. They will build their own bonds and connections. I'm an adoptive father, so if I have an extra hour, I'll spend it in orphan care or adoption care. If I take a photo and share that back, this actually happened. I noticed that four or five other people also did something similar. And just like that, across global spans, I found four or five other people that were in the adoption community. I didn't know that about my own workplace. So this is a simple example where you can build a fabric or an environment where people can be themselves, but then share that back in a meaningful way and then let the connective tissues form themselves. Yeah, it's, it is amazing just how deep and like personal relationship you can form with someone across a digital divide in the right context. I mean, you and I met virtually uh, and have like a very close friendship now. Um, it's just so counterintuitive, I think, for more traditional cultures where they were used to, you know, around the water cooler time, which was probably surface level at best. Um, Darren, kind of final question for you. I know you've been thinking a lot about frameworks for really like promoting not only psychological safety, but the, the power of psychology in particular framework. Uh, and your advice to leaders on same for creating that environment for employees. Yeah, I'm a big. I'm a big fan of Dr. David Rock. He has an amazing book called Your Brain at Work. And in it, he describes a model called SCARF. And he discovered in his research that any human experience will move you toward reward or threat on just five axes. SCARF, that's status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness, and fairness. And so what I advise to leaders is if you are thinking through the iterations in your distributed work policy, consider what you're doing through the lens of how will this impact our employee base, their status, their autonomy, their certainty, can they relate to it, will it feel fair? You don't want to create an organization that people are threatened by. And for many of these organizations that are just pushing policies without first asking the customer, which in this case is their team members, they're at risk of creating maybe well-intentioned products, ways of working, that actually threaten people on a psychological basis. And so by being aware of that, you can open up the discourse, have the conversations. You might not be able to pacify or please everyone in the organization, but just by knowing that that's how people's brains work, you can have a much more productive conversation. Yeah, uh, Molly maybe is the smartest of the three of us with your doctorate and <laughs> playing off of Darren's. God, I mean, in addition to just the power of the activities and the sequences that you've learned, uh, are you seeing things in like the behaviors that you can play back to managers that uh, would help them like lead these teams better or behaviors for employees, whether it's uh, kind of autonomy or empathy has been a huge theme here at the conference so far? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So 
I think a lot about how we set up our systems to reinforce the behaviors that we want, but also how we empower people. And so part of what we think about is, is building those relationships that help us overcome what I often talk about as operational distance, this idea of sometimes things do get lost in translation or we have a bad connection or I write something down too quickly and you don't understand what I meant. And how do we both build um, that affinity for each other and those relationships to really help us weather those times? And that is the most important thing when it comes down to I know you and I trust you and I feel like we're working towards shared goals, that's really the key that enables teams to work super well together and reach their full potential. And so that's something that we invest a lot in at Atlassian and is certainly one of the ways that we work, help people work together well wherever they are. Wherever they are, indeed. Well, look, especially with AI uh, steamrolling all of us a little bit. Um, it is never going to be more, well, we will never be as together as we were. Like it's going to become easier and easier and easier to do work in a distributed asynchronous manner. Uh, more people kind of freelance and gig, like the problem is only going to get more complex. So we have to address this world of being able to sustain productive and engaged cultures in a digital, remote, or virtual first status. Again, no matter what your stance is and how often people are meant to be together, I'm sure we could do this all afternoon, but I just want to say thank you for sharing your knowledge and encourage everybody who's listening to uh, look up Atlassian and GitLab in particular and their frameworks. And maybe as a final thought, like any, any final tweet level thought you'd give to everybody listening as a advice on how to move forward? I'd start by saying that we're in the earliest innings of this. Uh, let's iterate together. We're all learning together. Let's build a future that's better than the past. Love that. Molly? Yeah, I think this is a moment where we really get to reimagine what our work and lives look like together. And that's really exciting. Let's be optimists. Thank you, guys. Thank you.